Hey Clutterbugs, I'm so excited to be here live with you today. We're doing a live question and answer where I can answer all of your most pressing organizing questions. Feel free to ask me anything at all, but I do have some questions. Um, hi Shelby, I do have some questions that you guys have already asked me and this is the one I get asked all the time. So Ashley Nowak says, how do you get family members on board with decluttering? My husband and kids are borderline hoarders and I'm the opposite. Clutter makes me feel overwhelmed and gives me anxiety, but it doesn't seem to bother them. I definitely get asked this all the time and it's something I struggle with too because I care a lot more about what my home looks like than my family. That's just it. They don't really care what the what, what the home looks like. So um how do we get them to care a little bit more? So there's this is like a two-edged question. First of all, a uh, two-answered question. The thing is we can't make somebody care about something the same way that we do. The only thing we can really do is lead by example. But that doesn't mean that I don't have a trick for you when it comes to decluttering to help your family let go. Decluttering is hard emotionally, not physically. And especially for people who haven't been doing the research or watching videos or reading books about it, they know nothing about it except that it feels very wrong to get rid of the things you've acquired in life. It goes against kind of human nature. We're hunters and gatherers. We're supposed to collect things. We're supposed to have things. And there comes a point where those things that felt really good when we acquired them start feeling really bad because they're filling up our home and making us miserable and making our life harder. But it's hard to see that correlation. And so to help someone in your family declutter, here's what I've done with clients, with my own family, with my kids, with my husband, and it works every time. What you say to them is, listen, I just want to try something with you. No pressure. I want you to sit and relax. And I'm just going to hold up some things that are yours. And I want you to say yes or no. Yes, you want to keep it or no, it can let go. No pressure. Anytime you say no to something, it can stay. And so we hold up a shirt from their closet or a toy. Do you like this? Do you play with this? Do you want to let this go? And at first they're going to say yes to everything, but you are going to come across something. Maybe it's a piece of garbage. Maybe it's something ripped or stained. They'll be like, oh, that can go. And then you're like, awesome. This is amazing. Good job. And you hold up something else. And after a few minutes, they're going to start saying, yes, that can go to a lot more things. Again, I know this has worked for you. You're doing the work while they're sitting on their butt watching you. But this is how you show someone how fun, how non-stressful, and how really rewarding decluttering can be. You're getting the ball started for them, no pressure on them whatsoever, and you're showing them how exciting it feels to, rate, to make real progress. So this is what I do with clients. This is what I do with my kids. This is what I do with my husband. And what I've noticed is... By the end, they're like, that can go, that can go, that can go, that can go. They're really getting into it. And then they can declutter on their own because you've shown them how. Okay, so hopefully that is um, really helpful. Christina has the same kind of question. Christine Hansen says, how do I get my husband to clean up after himself? Put his dirty clothes in the hamper. And so this is a question, again, I get asked all the time. And I think the best thing to do is see where he's naturally dropping his clothes. Don't tell me it's all over the house. I hope it's not all over the house, but it's usually like in the bathroom in the corner or in a corner in the in the bedroom. Why not put the hamper there? That's the first thing I would recommend is like move the hamper to where he's naturally tossing it. So he's getting in the habit of tossing it into something. And then you can slowly move the hamper back to where you want it be, like training a puppy. It honestly really works. And the other thing that I really recommend is just doing every night before you guys, after dinner, like before you start watching TV, maybe you watch TV while you eat dinner. So you're going to have to maybe before bed, we just do a five minute pickup. It's like the whole family's getting involved. It's five minutes. We can do five minutes, you guys. Set a timer on the stove and everybody's doing five minutes and just explain to them that you do a lot for the family and this would mean a lot to you. Could everybody just give you five minutes? There's no way no one, everyone's, they might grumble, but there's no way they're going to say no to five minutes. And again, this is training someone and yourself to pick up after yourself because being messy is a habit. We're not consciously being messy. We're not, your husband isn't trying to be disrespectful by putting his dirty clothes on the floor. He's just in the habit of dropping his dirty clothes on the floor. And he probably has been in this habit since he was a kid. So we have to create 
new habits. And the way to do that is daily routine, repetition. Every time he picks it up off the floor and puts it in the hamper at night during those five minutes, he's training his brain to put the clothes in the hamper and eventually he'll just put them in the hamper. I promise. Five minute tidies. That's how we train ourselves to be tidy people. So if you guys have a question that you want to ask live, yes, put the question mark so I can see so it stands out from the other comments. So we have here can I discuss car organization? Mine continues to be a mess. So does mine. My car is gross. I have no advice for you. I am such a ladybug. I Nobody really sees my car, so the only time I clean it is if someone else is going to ride in it. Boo, I wish I had advice for you. I guess having a garbage can, especially if you have kids, is really, really helpful. And I have an alarm set. I have so many alarms because I have ADHD. I forget to remember things. So I have an alarm once every two weeks to just take stuff out of my car. It's like on Sundays, like take stuff out of your car. Sometimes I snooze that alarm if I'm being completely honest, but sometimes I actually uh, take time to let it go. When we talk about organizing solutions for your car, I have tried everything. I've tried things that strap on the back of the seats. I've tried fancy trunk organizers. I've tried so much stuff that just became more clutter in my car. So the best thing to do is just have a garbage can and occasionally clean it out. I also like having car, I get the car wiping, like the armor all wipes, they're in the glove compartment. So if I'm waiting for my kids at an event or they're like, I've taken them to an activity or I'm just sitting somewhere waiting for anything, sometimes I remember to get the armor all wipes out and dust my car because it's convenient because they're already there. Okay, so if you guys have a question, oh, Beth says, how often do you declutter? Do you feel guilty buying and bringing new things into the house? Sometimes I do. I declutter a lot, Beth. And But I will tell you something that happened with, de I used to declutter a lot more, but I shopped a lot, if I'm being completely honest. And the, the, the thing that happened, it was so, I felt so much shame and guilt decluttering things that I had bought that I shouldn't have bought that it changed the way I've shopped. And it really stopped me from impulse buying. I still impulse buy sometimes, but I'm a thousand times better than I used to be because I felt that pain of letting go. So I think the uncomfortable feelings, the shame, the guilt that comes with decluttering is really important because it's teaching us how to be better consumers. It's teaching us to think before we buy. I know it did for me and so many other people that I've talked to who have gone through the decluttering journey. But yeah, we still declutter because I don't always remember to do the one in one out. So if I'm out and I'm picking something up or if I'm getting a gift, Christmas, my birthday, whatever it is, our kids are always having things come in. I don't always remember to get things out at the same rate. And so every few months, I probably let go of two trash bags worth of donations. And I think that's really normal for an average household. Oh, hello. Thank you. You donated. That's very sweet. Love from Germany. Thanks for your videos. Thank you, Annika. I really, really appreciate that. That's so sweet. Um, so if you have <laughs> any questions, put the question mark so I, I can see this. Stacy says, how do I declutter my nightstand? It ends up being a catch-all for everything. Not sure what's actually good to keep there. <laughs> this is such a great question. Okay, so you're nightstand, the top of your dresser, your kitchen counter, the entranceway, these are hot spots. And I love this question so much because the truth is your clutter in these spots is really telling you, this is your everyday clutter, things you're using all the time. It's telling you where your organization is lacking. And so take a look on here and say, what's actually here? And does it have a home that's really close? So if the top of your bedside table has Kleenex boxes and notepads and your books and a hand lotion, is there a drawer right underneath that we can clear out to put a home for some of those things? We should be creating homes 
exactly where we're naturally dropping things. So if your mail's going on your kitchen counter, that's where your mail sorter should be. If you're coming in and you're dropping like keys and backpacks and those things, but you have a home for it somewhere else, you need to move the home to where you're where you're naturally dropping things. And we feel like we just need to try harder or we're lazy maybe, but that's not it. We have to work with how we're naturally organizing our things. So there's no rule of what anyone should keep on their bedside table, but you should t- take a look at what you're naturally piling there and say, where could I create a home? If it's trash, put a trash can right beside your bedside table. I know it sounds it's like, why I could just walk, but no, why? Put a little trash can there. Um, maybe you need to install some floating bookshelves right above it on your on your wall if you're putting a lot of books there are other things that need to have a home that's close by so think outside the box but let your clutter really be the thing that tells you where your organization is lacking and think how can i create a home for these things without moving without walking even a step um okay kim says your older empty nester purging and organizing how to get rid or better purge and organize things that the kids may need or want to save okay so you have kids in a new apartment and college kids i this is such a common question kim because We think as parents, it's our job to preserve memories for our kids and to pass down treasures. But what I'm hearing over and over again is our kids want to really create their new memories. Gone are the days where our kids want grandma's china and antiques and things like that. So a really good way to go is the container concept, which means we limit the things to where it fits in our home. So having one Rubbermaid tote per kid that you put all the special memories into. And when it's full, it's full, and you make the decision of what stays and what goes. And you're really doing your kids kids a favor. I know I tell this story all the time, but when Milo was born, he's the first, he was the first grandson. My mother-in-law brought over seven rubbermaid totes of baby boy clothes, seven totes that she had kept for 30 years in her basement. And I have no storage. I have a Harry Potter closet that's already full and no place else to put this. But I felt so much guilt and shame like I had to keep this because she had kept it for 30 years. Obviously, it's important. She kept it for 30 years. Now I have to what keep it for 30 years and pass it to Milo. Where am I going to put this? I was so stressed out. It was none of it was in good shape. And there was a few things that I was like, okay, maybe But I swore to myself I was never going to do this to my children, that I was going to create a cultivated collection that was small enough that they could put that somewhere in their home, that it wouldn't be a burden, but still know that I kept special memories for them. And I trusted myself that they're not going to know the memories I didn't keep, but they're going to be grateful for the memories that I did. So one tote per kid is the rule and no guilt, no shame. You're doing them a favor. Do not be my mother-in-law and burden your kids with guilty clutter. Um, okay. Hi. Uh, there's so many questions. I have a, another question here that I want that Erica and her mom asked, how long did it take your house to get completely decluttered, organized and functioning without excess? thought and stress. More simply put, how long before the new lifestyle was second nature? Okay, so the truth is it was a full year before I wasn't opening a closet and have things dumping on my head, before I had to hunt for the umbrella every time it rained and like dig things out, before I wasn't losing something every single day. I used to lose something and look around for it. I still remember the panic and the rage I would feel. I know I put this somewhere and why can't I find it? Um, I, I remember that like it was yesterday. And honestly, it was a full year before my home was just easy and I wasn't losing things anymore and I didn't have to dig anymore. But that's not to say I was done. I just continually level up my organization, but it isn't the same amount of work that it was before. And it isn't hard. It isn't emotional like it used to be. But I feel like organizing and decluttering is definitely a practice, not a project. And so that's why it's important to do a tiny bit, like five or 10 minutes every day, 
because it creates a habit. It creates just like we brush our teeth before bed or we put on our pajamas or we get up and make our coffee. It's another small habit that's second nature. We just maintain a functional home. And the only way to create habits is repetition, daily repetition. So set a timer in your phone every day for five or 10 minutes to do some small thing to make your home more functional. And on the days where you're like looking around, you're like, I don't even know what I would do. Straighten a junk drawer or find 21 things that can leave or maybe get rid of two shirts you don't wear anymore. Small baby steps are the secret to success. Um, T. Clay asks, can you give a one sentence description of the four types of organizing bugs? Heck yes, I can. I love this question. Okay, so a butterfly is a visual and a big picture thinker. So they don't want details. One sentence. Could I do this? I can do this. A butterfly is a visual out of sight, out of mind, but they can't do complicated organization. A bee is visual, out of sight, out of mind, but they like lots of categories and detailed organization. A cricket is a hidden organizer. They get really stressed out looking at their things, but they love details and lots of categories. And a ladybug likes to hide things. They don't want to see things, but they can't do really detailed, complicated organization. So basically, it breaks down to, would you rather, if you, to know if you're a detailed person or not a detailed person, this sometimes can get complicated. Would you rather just put something away fast, like, oh, here, just toss it in the drawer, boop, and take the time to look for it later? Or are you the person who will naturally stop and take the time to put something where it goes when you're done with it because you want to find it fast? So do you want to put it away fast? Or do you want to find it fast? And I know you're thinking, I want both of those things. Listen, personally, I would love that too, but I'm never going to open a lid to put something away. See behind me, I, this only works because I never use the things inside there or very, very rarely. We're talking about your everyday clutter. If something is hard to put away, hard as in it takes a step or a second or two, a macro organizer, so a butterfly and a ladybug just won't do it. That's not one sentence. <laughs> I just, I ramble. I apologize for that. So hopefully that makes sense. And visual versus hidden, a visual organizer doesn't mean you want to see clutter. Uh, being visual does not mean that you like looking at mess or clutter or your eyes want to be attacked by things. It means it's really out of sight, out of mind for you. So important things and things you use every day should be out. Reminders to pay bills or your calendar or your toothbrush if you're using it all the time. Maybe it goes in a cup on your sink as opposed to in the drawer. It's simple and subtle differences that make a huge difference when it comes to your organizing style. Um, <laughs> Beth says, I love you, Cass. Will there be a new season of Hot Mess House? I don't know. At this point, I don't think so. I'm definitely thinking um, they would have let me know by now, which is very sad. We have talked about maybe pitching the show to other networks like maybe Netflix or um, Amazon Prime or Apple TV as like one of their originals. But the truth is I'm getting kind of old, friends, and I'm not sure. I don't love being on camera if I'm being completely honest. I loved the show, but I felt really insecure the whole time doing it, right? I was doing my own hair and makeup and I was like worried about what I looked like instead of worrying about... Well, I was also worrying about their home, but um, I just love organizing and I'm passionate about it and I love helping people. And so the show was amazing because I got a big budget and I got to help people on a really big scale. But I'm also so grateful for YouTube. And right now I'm at Stephanie's house and I'm doing her laundry room and I'm doing her basement and I help other people and I do online coaching. And um, it's so great because I'm not stressed about wrinkles and hair and all of the things that shouldn't really matter. So I don't know how I feel about the show. Um, 
and I don't know what's happening. As soon as I get a confirmation, I will definitely <laughs> let you guys know. But that's how I, I don't know. How would you feel, I guess? Um, maybe I'm crazy pants, but I just, I, I feel like being on television made me really insecure about my body and my face and just everything. Um, Danny, I think you're a cricket and you're sure your husband is a butterfly. How can you organize your kitchen for him? You're willing to compromise as long as it stays more organized. Greetings from Chile. Um, hi, Danny. So my advice is if he's the one that generally does the cooking, take a look at the things that he's using most often. So an example is a knife block on the counter. If someone's constantly chopping, they would rather have that. Or if they're... Um, the type of person who, I don't know, has like all the utensils and put them in a can up on the counter instead of in a drawer. So we're taking a look at visual things that we can do for the stuff you use every day. So spices out if he uses a lot of spices. But that being said, you don't have to keep the things that he's not using all the time out if he's a butterfly, just the things he's using all the time. So if it's like snacks and cookies, just put them in a pretty jar on the counter or in a basket on the counter. You don't have to the, look at the things he's naturally leaving out as an indication of the things that you should create visual homes for. So we always look at our clutter and at our mess as a cue of what's not working. And we create homes for those things, not the things that are actually being put away. Um, Carolyn says, how can you tell what percentage of which clutter bug you are if you're more than one? I don't know. And I think we've looked at the quiz before where it gives you a percentage, but honestly, don't over, don't just don't overthink this. The fact that you're asking this, Carolyn, here's what I know about you immediately. You're a bee or a cricket <laughs> because you want to know details, exactly what percentage. So um, I love that, but I want to encourage you to just look at what's working and what's not and ask yourself why. And even though I think the four clutter bug styles is important, you can be a little bit of everything in different rooms. So at the end of the day, everyone's different. You can't put anyone into four categories. And what really matters is that we're having a conversation with yourself that organizing isn't one size fits all. And I don't have to organize the way that Marie Kondo does or the home edit does. What I have to do is what look is realize what works for me why it works for me. And maybe in one room, I need to have more visual things because I forget things all the time in that space. And maybe in the kitchen, I have to have a more of a cricket style or more of a ladybug style because looking at things in that space really stresses me out. It's just, it's just all about self-awareness and you don't have to call yourself any of the clutter bugs, but I do want you to realize that you're not messy you organize differently. And if you've set up a system and you're still dropping your keys, you know, on top of your dresser instead of putting them in the drawer, there's nothing wrong with you. And you're not lazy. It's just that you need a visual system to catch your keys. You need to put a basket there or a hook. Done and done. No more shame when it comes to managing our house. No more guilt. No more feeling like we're not good enough or we need to try harder. We just need to adapt. We need to adapt our organization to work with us instead of trying to like put ourselves in some crazy organizing box that doesn't work. Um, okay, so uh, let's ask another question. Oh, this is a good question from Kelly. My question is sentimental items. I have a hard time parting with gifts given to me, even if she knows she'll never use it. So now she's has her family giving her gift cards and other things that aren't actual like movie tickets and grocery cards instead of, you know, ugly sweaters. But what about all the stuff she's received years prior? She has a hard time getting rid of it. Maybe it's because you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. What is the best way to get over this hurdle? So Kelly, this is so common. This is guilty clutter gifts that we've received from people, you're probably a very empathetic person. And so we really, empathetic people hate hurting people's feelings. You tend to be a people pleaser. And sometimes you can even people please your stuff. You can even, I think Toy Story, 
was a great movie, but holy heck, it made people feel guilty about getting rid of stuffed animals and toys, didn't it? We feel like, we feel almost, even the junk we don't like and don't use, we're people pleasing that junk. And we're allowing things to make us feel guilt and shame about letting it go, even though we don't want it in our home. And I promise you, your loved ones who gave you these gifts, they were just giving you a gesture to show you that that they love you. And they most certainly would not want you to feel burdened to keep it forever. That is not their intent. And if they knew that you felt that way and that you were holding on to things and feeling like you were filling your home and had clutter you didn't want because they gave it to you, they would feel so bad. And so just donate it. They'll never know. And if they do ask, hey, where's that hideous sweater I bought you for Mother's Day? You can say, oh, it wasn't for me. I passed it on to somebody else who I know would love it. Thank you, though. And and that's it. And it's not a big deal. And I think this is such a good thing to do, especially if we have kids, because it's important that we mimic this behavior of putting boundaries on ourselves, putting boundaries on our home and our stuff, and not people pleasing our junk. We're standing up for ourselves and it doesn't hurt other people's feelings. It really doesn't. And um, this is a hard lesson to learn, but I think you'll see once you do it, (laughs) you're not going to feel bad. Um, Okay, so Shelly. Hi, Shelly. What are your thoughts about combining areas in one small space? So example, a spare room slash office. I think you do you. I think that... um, If you have a small space, you should maximize every square inch. And I think it's really strange when people say, this is just this room or this is just this room. Everybody's home is different. Your space is different. I think you should be combining different spaces. And I think it's a really easy thing to do. So in my family room downstairs, we have like a video game section. We have a board game section. We have Joe's office in there. You got to do what you got to do. But how do you keep it feeling maybe cohesive? You can really do that with just organization, having the same color scheme without a little decorating. Um, You can have a space that doesn't feel like a hodgepodge, mismatched, crazy pantsness just by, yeah, treating it all as one space. Um, Kristen says, you like detailed systems, but some hidden and some visual. What clutter bug are you? I don't know. You're, You're a cricket bee that's okay. You're part B and part cricket, probably depending on the room or the space. Um, And that's totally fine. People make up their own little names like Butterbee. We we hear Butterbee a lot or, um, you know, Lady Bird or something. I don't know. Anyways, uh, it doesn't matter. It, It really doesn't matter. I think the important thing is that you know that about yourself. You know you're detailed and you know sometimes you like visual and sometimes you like hidden. And so you're having that conversation of, what's going to work and what isn't and you know why now instead of just looking at you know something in a magazine and going oh I'm going to just buy all those containers to match or just going to Walmart and buying a bunch of random containers you can now really put some thought into your organization because you know yourself so the name of your clutter bug doesn't matter just that you know exactly what works for you and why um Yami says, (laughs) you say you love to label stuff, but labels contribute to an area looking busy for you and you can't have visual clutter at all. How do you work around that? This is, so this is the same thing. If labels don't work for you, awesome. You know that about yourself. Don't even worry about it. But I want you to just kind of challenge yourself. I just want to ask, are you remembering where everything is without a label? If the question is yes, you don't need a label. Are the rest of your family members remembering where things are and actually putting things away without a label? Then you don't need a label. But I hear people say sometimes, oh, I don't want labels. It's going to look cluttered. And then I look around their house and there's stuff all over their house. (laughs) They're not putting things away. But I, and I know that if their bins were labeled, they'd be way more likely to actually put their things away. So be honest with yourself. If your home is staying tidy and organized and neat without labels and you're remembering where things are, you definitely don't need labels. If you're like me, here's, here's, I'm going to tell you story time. So in my fridge, 
I used to have like seven bottles, maybe not that many, but a lot of ketchup all different and I'd be like we'd hunt for the ketchup and sometimes we put it on the top shelf and sometimes we put it in the door and sometimes we put it at the bottom shelf and now sometimes I couldn't find the ketchup and I'd buy more ketchup and we'd already have ketchup and every day I would spend five ten seconds looking for the ketchup we eat a lot of ketchup we have children and one day I was like this is ridiculous it's going in the door this is where it's going and I labeled it condiments And I was probably the biggest offender, just shoving it back in mindlessly. But once it had a label, my brain, without even thinking, would just, it must have been reading that label without me even registering it. Everybody, me included, were just putting the ketchup back where it went. And I no longer had to look for the ketchup. And so that is why I think labels are so important. Yeah, if I needed envelopes, I'd have to look every time. I'd never remember. (laughs) I would have to look in every one of these boxes every freaking time. Uh, But now I just know. And more than that, when I'm done using the envelope, I don't just set it on the shelf or leave it out. My brain is like a magnet putting it away. So that's why I think labels are really important, Um, especially if you have ADHD and you are kind of forgetful and you are the type of person just to put something down instead of putting it away or shove something in random spots all over your house. Labels can help you focus. They can help you focus. But if you don't need that, then absolutely don't do that. Colleen says, you like things organized. Um, Sorry. It's going so fast. Uh, I'm coming. Colleen, you like things organized with detail, but only have time to be a clumper. Do you have any tips for this? So you are a cricket, but you kind of have to like dump fast is what I'm hearing. You have to ladybug or put things away because time is important. So here's what I'm going to suggest to you. Your everyday things should be organized like a ladybug then. So you're done with your makeup, just toss it back in your makeup basket or a makeup bag or whatever it is, a tray. I love trays. Or the things you're using all the time, But the things that are really important that you want to find quickly, maybe it's your paperwork, maybe it's those things like your crafting supplies, go ahead and set that up like a cricket because you're not using those and accessing those every single day. And you can take the time for things that you don't access every day to put it away in a more detailed way. So everyday things you're going to organize like a ladybug and then those things that you are are kind of like more important, but you don't access every day, you can organize those like a cricket. Um, Angie, how can you clean up your small scrapbook room when you have no money? Wait, where'd it go? When you have no money and don't want to let anything go. Okay, so unfortunately, we can't organizing isn't magical and it isn't going to grow your space and i yes we can jenga stack things or get like lots of stacking bins and in the short term we might have a little bit more of a tidy space but every time we go to use something it's all just going to come crumbling big down into a mess again and we're going to be in this vicious cycle of tidying and then making a mess and tidying and making a mess so you did mention you had a small space But then you also mentioned you didn't want to let anything go. But decluttering is the only way to get what you're looking for. And decluttering is free. And it can make you money too. But here's what I'm going to say about scrapbooking, crafting, any type of thing like that, books. It's identity clutter. So you identify as a crafter. You are a scrapbooker. So it's harder for you to let things go because every time you let something go, you feel like you're letting go part of your identity. A a crafter has a really hard time getting rid of craft supplies because they feel like they're a crafter. So then therefore every craft supply is important, but it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You can still let some things go, right? And keep the things that are really important. So Check your mindset and remind yourself it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Take another fresh look at your supplies and say, are there things I know I'll never use? And can just those things go to make my space more manageable? Um, Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's so kind of you. Thank you, Maz K. I really appreciate it so, so much. Um, Okay. Another question here. 
Um, oh, Karen Mom 4. You need to find home, she put that in quotation, for many items. How do you suggest a ladybug make fast, easy decisions with homeless items? So everybody has these homeless bibbity bops, random things throughout their home. And this is a question that's so good. Listen, Karen Mom 4, this is such a good question because Everybody has this, and especially bees and crickets are overthinkers. They tend to over overanalyze, overorganize, overthink things, and they're like, where do these felt pads go for the bottom of my chairs? Or where do these random 3M strips go? Or, oh my gosh, I have this one Allen key, right, that I, that I use for the Ikea furniture. Where should this random thing go? And so we always think in the bigger categories. What do all three of the things I just mentioned have in common? They're home maintenance. So do you have a spot in your home right now that you keep other home maintenance type things? Where's the first place you would look for this random Allen key? It's probably going to be with your home maintenance things. So we just put those things in with that. And it's also okay to have a utility drawer, a junk drawer, or a homeless clutter basket, a basket for random things. I think you should have a random thing basket that you're like, I, I don't know where this is, but it might be important. Oh my gosh, where should I put it? Not on your kitchen counter, put it in the random bin. And then when you need something, you look in the random bin for those things. Now this isn't everything. Not everything should go in there. We shouldn't put light bulbs in there. We, should, we shouldn't put batteries in there. We shouldn't put things that need a dedicated home, but there are going to be those little random stuff. You know, you find like a screw or a piece of a kid's toy, but you don't know where it is or a puzzle piece. And you're like, I don't even know where the actual puzzle is. It's okay. It's okay to have a random basket where these things go so that when you do think to look for it, you'll know it has a place. <clears throat> um, okay. <clears throat> Laura says, what do you do if you're between a ladybug and a bee? You took the quiz twice and got two different results. So a ladybug and a bee are completely opposite. So I doubt you're both of those things. A ladybug is a person who is a really big picture thinker. They don't do details. When they're done using something, they're just like leaving little trails. They're dropping it where it goes. They're shoving messily into bins just to get it put away without a lot of thought. Whereas a lady, whereas a bee is really meticulous. They're the type of person that thinks in details, that has plans. Their brain naturally is very categorized. The idea of tossing an earring in a drawer with office supplies would make them cringe, right? And so, whereas for me, I'm just like, I'm just cleaning off the desk. Everything goes in the drawer, random mixed up middle. Bees do not think like that. And they would rather leave it out than throw it in the drawer and mix it up with things where they don't, where it doesn't belong. So that's the difference between the detailed and the non-detailed thinker. And ladybugs get really stressed out by looking at anything, the toaster, everything they want, kind of, they want a clean, clean slate, maybe just some home decor, but they don't want to look at a spatula. Whereas a bee is very more, much more practical with their visual organization. And they're like, I'm going to use this spatula every morning to flip my egg. I want it in a can on my counter. Or I want the, the front of my fridge to have all the things that to remind me or pictures of my family. You like to see your everyday things. Not everything, but the important things, the things you use all the time, the things you find beautiful, you like to have out. So I don't think that you could be both a bee and a ladybug because they are so very, very different. And so just ask yourself, are you a naturally detailed person, would you throw an earring in a drawer with office supplies if you were just quickly cleaning off the desk? Or would you leave it out before you did that, right? And are you a visual person? Is it out of sight, out of mind? Do you like looking at your everyday things? Or are you like, no, I would rather just shove it all in a hole than look at it and have to dig it out to find it later? That's just a really good way to, to take a look at your organizing style. Um, okay, if you if you have a question that you want to ask, you can put a little boop question mark and then I will see it. Laura says, what do you do if you're between, oh, I, I just answered that one, Laura. 
I don't really think you are. Okay, so if you have another question, just go ahead and put a question mark there. Tanya says, any suggestions of combining a, de a deceased loves one home and items uh, from your own family's belongings? Yeah, I would just encourage you to be really mindful of not filling your space out of guilt and not filling your space out of obligation. Just because your loved one kept something for their entire life doesn't mean that it has to be important to you. And so take a look at things that really are treasured to you and that you love and that you might want to have in your home and display, not just keep out of obligation. So grandma's china, antiques, pieces of furniture, maybe your mom's wedding dress. If those things aren't something that are really special to you, your loved one would never want you to feel burdened and to keep something just out of obligation. The best thing you can do to honor your loved one's memory is to pass those things on for somebody else to love and enjoy. You are not honoring your grandmother's memory by keeping her things in your basement in a box. And you are not honoring her memory by living in a home with things that you don't love or find beautiful just because they were your loved ones, right? And so it's emotional. It's supposed to be emotional. It's also so cathartic. Take pictures, write down memories you had. Maybe you remember having dinner on your grandmother's china. Take a picture of that china and write a little note and, and keep that, keep those cherished memories without having to keep the physical things. Uh, Miss Sunrise says, what's my favorite high quality label maker? So the thing about labels is I have... I like the Dymo the best for small things. So I use this all the time to like label my cards or paperwork or things like that. This label maker, little label strips like this are not good for things like bins and baskets, um, any type of containers that are inside because size matters, friends. All right. Bigger is better when it comes to labels. So I love my little Dymo label maker for small things like file folders and things like that. But for big things like behind me, I do like using the Cricut Joy. Now, it's labor intensive. If you are not a tech person, if you are not a crafty person, do not buy a Cricut Joy. Don't do it because it's a pain in the butt. It looks pretty. What you could do instead is get chalk labels from Amazon, but get a chalk marker. Don't get a chalk pen because it won't smudge that way. And just peel and stick um, chalk labels. You can still make it big, right? So you can see it from across the room or when you open up a cabinet, but you're not going to worry about like smudging it off or something like that. Angela, do you think it's possible to have one organizing style at work and another at home? Totally. Absolutely. She says she feels like she's way more organized at work and a hot mess at home. I think that's totally normal. I think that's so normal. And at work, you probably have coworkers who have set up other systems or using systems. So you have like learned behaviors and there's probably like a file management system already in place. That's probably a little detailed, but at home, that stuff just isn't important to you and that's okay. So you're kind of following another organizing style at work out of necessity because you have to be, but at home when you can relax and just be yourself, it's okay to just throw things in a basket and call it a day. As long as it's a macro organized basket, right? As long as it's like ladybugs have to have some sort of sorting, but big, big, big categories and butterflies need those big, big categories. Isabel says, how do you get your daughter to declutter her toys? She won't let go of any of them and her bedroom is always a mess despite the clear bins that you bought her. So just like we talked about in the beginning, kids and everyone feels, it feels weird and wrong and unnatural to let things go. But what I really suggest doing to your daughter is saying to her, listen, we're just going to do a really fun thing. I want you to sit on your bed, just relax. I'm going to hold up things and I want you to tell me yes or no. If you like it, if you've used it, or if it's something we could give to another child who would really love to play with it. And at first she's going to want to keep everything. 
but I promise you she's going to start to be like, actually, I never play with that Barbie or that one can go or that one's a messy or that can go and that can go. If she's having a lot of anxiety and nothing wants to go, we're going to try a different technique called toy rotation. And so toy rotation means nothing's going to leave. We're just going to rotate toys out. And what I recommend you doing is you know what she's playing with and what she really isn't. And so take the stuff she doesn't play with as often, pack it up into storage bins, or use those like sucker sucker bags, you know, those vacuum seal bags for stuffed animals and things like that, and just getting it out of her space so that she can really live with less. And then you can swap them out when she starts to get bored or in six months or a year from now, if she hasn't asked for any of those toys, you can feel confident letting them go um, without, without the stress and the anxiety from her. Mrs. 182 says, you like the point about identity clutter. Any tips for dealing with a book lover, CD collecting partner? You've decluttered most of your stuff now. So exactly. Book, books, music, all of that is identity clutter. So anytime somebody has a big collection of something, it's identity clutter. My stepmom used to have a big cow collection. She was the cow person. Everybody bought her cow stuff all the time. Whatever it is, we tend to have an excess of it and getting rid of any of it feels really wrong. So if you have a loved one who prides themselves on being a book lover or is well-read, well-educated and continues to collect and hold on and never let any of these things go, it just is helpful to let them know of why it's hard for them. This is what is called identity clutter. You can get rid of some of these things and still be a book lover. Are there any of these books that you know you'll never read again? And can we pass your love of reading on to someone else? Can we take these books and share them with someone who couldn't afford to buy them? Can we drop them off at, um, you know, a school for kids? Or can we create a little library somewhere in our community where we can really pass your passion on and share your passion with other people who have the same passion as you? And so that's what works for identity clutter is, first of all, ident- identifying it, that that's what it is. And the second part is really showing them how important it is to share their love and their passion. And it doesn't have to be all or nothing. We can select some things that we can share that you know you're not going to use again. And it'll make the collection of things you do love easier to find, prettier to look at, and just way more manageable. Okay. Um, Jessica says, tiny house tips for five people. Oh, you know what I'm going to say. We can only keep as much as fits in the space that we have. And our house is a container. And we have to, if you have a tiny house, it's really important. You're only keeping the most important everyday used things. But there are lots of places where you can have storage under the bed is really important. Make sure that you're maximizing your space. If you have blankets that you just sometimes use or off-season clothing, shrink those suckers down in vacuum seal bags. Really take advantage of every square inch of your space, making sure that you have bookshelves that go all the way up for um, open shelving, that you're having hooks on the back of every single door. If you have a door in your house that doesn't have hooks on the back, you need to get hooks in storage on the back of your doors right away. But the biggest impact that you can have is just having less stuff. Um, okay, this is the last question. I'm going to go after this. Katie says, my teen-ish son asked for his dresser to be removed and for a bin type of storage. Yes, uh, for his closet, for the no-fold. Uh, what ideas do you have for that space? Yeah, bin system is the way to go. Hands down, I think Honestly, every kid should get rid of the dresser and go with a bin system instead. And I think go as high as you can afford. I like the Calyx system from Ikea the best because the bins are really big. They're 13 by 13 and they will hold as much as two, like two normal dresser sizes worth of clothing. And if you're going, so a normal dresser would just be these two bottom shelves. But if you're going up as high as it can go, not only do you have more clothing space, but you also have more storage space for displaying things or whatever. So get 
bins at the bottom for socks, underwear, things like that. Anything small that he doesn't want to fold, he can toss into bins like t-shirts and pants, but he can also fold things like sweaters or other things um, and have spots for hats, accessories, all of that type of stuff. So as high as you can go, is great. Usually two people who tend to not like to fold are more likely to hang. So a quick tip for putting away clothes for people who like have a laundry basket and even they're just like, I don't want to put things in a dresser is take the hangers to the basket and put the shirts on the hanger and then lay them beside. So it takes seconds. It's faster than folding. You can do this in front of the TV, just like you would fold in front of the TV. You can bring the hangers to you and mindlessly just put your shirts on the hangers and then lay them flat, then pick up all the hangers and just hang them into your closet. And so hanging, it can be faster than folding. You can still do it in front of the TV, um, but it's a really easy way to put away your clothes. Okay, so thank you guys so, so much for tuning in. Let me just see if there's um, any other questions. This last one, okay. Any advice to give to your 11-year-old who has the feeling she needs space on her desk and stop piling stuff? So again, we let our clutter tell us what where our organization is lacking. So what is she piling on her desk? Is it a bunch of papers? Is it school, like schoolwork and papers and things like that? Right above her desk, you should hang these filing magazine rack folders, like hangers that hang on the wall. Is it her markers and her pens and all the things she uses to do art? Get an art cart. A cart is so awesome for keeping the clutter off your desk, but right beside. So you're still putting something down the same height. You don't have to move. You don't have to walk, but it can be wheeled away into any other space and it keeps your actual workspace clear. So use the wall and use a cart right beside her desk to create homes for the things that she's naturally piling on her workspace. Okay, so thank you guys so, so much. I really appreciate, we should do this more often. I think I'm gonna do more lives because I like this. I like answering the questions that you guys have. I'm just so grateful to each and every one of you and all of your support. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you spend some time this weekend, just a few minutes, 15 minutes, decluttering and organizing something and creating a space that's just a little more functional that gets you one step closer to less work, less tidying, and less stress in your home. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you next time. Oh, thank you, Denise. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys and I'll see you next time.